I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It always seemed so to us. But now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I am brazed to it. I cannot uh, conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could. <laughs> Whereupon she grew round wombed and had indeed, sir, a son for her cradle, ere yeah, she had a husband for a bed. Do you smell a fault? No, I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have a son, sir, by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account, though this knave came something saucily to the world before he was sent for, yet was his mother fair. <laughs> there was good sport at his making, <laughs> and the whore's son must be acknowledged. <laughs> Do you know this noble gentleman, Edwin? No, my lord. My lord of Kent, remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and see you to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He has been out nine years. The way he shall again. The king is coming! of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. I shall, my lord. In time, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and busyness from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we unburdened crawl towards death. <laughs> Our son of Cornwall, and you are no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers that future strife may be prevented now. The two great princes, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you shall we say so? Love us most, that we, our largest bounty, may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than word can wield the matter. Dearer than eyesight, space and liberty, beyond what can be valued rich or rare, no less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honour, as much as child e'er loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, beyond all manner of so much I love you. What shall Cordelia speak? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, plenteous rivers and wide skirted meads, we make thee, lady, to thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. Right. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife to Cornwall? Speak. Sir. I am made of that self-metal as my sister. Prize me at her worth. In my true heart I find she names my very deed of love, only she comes too short. <laughs> that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses, and by 
find I am alone, felicitate in your dear highness love. Well, then, poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue. To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample herd of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. But now, our joy, although the last and least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested. What can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak! Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. Oh, how, Cordelia? Mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. Good my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as are right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honour you. Why have my sisters husbands, if they say they love you all? Happily when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. For sure I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father all. That goes thy heart with this. I, my good lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Well, let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of those orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity, and property of love, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. Good my leave. Peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery hands and avoid my sight. So be my grave, my peace, says. Here I give her father's heart from her. Call France! Hoosters! Call Burgundy! Cornwall! And Albany! With my two daughters thou hast digest this third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred nights by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due course. Only we shall retain the name and all the addition to a king. This way, revenue. Execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours, which to confirm this coronet part betwixt you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honoured as my king, loved as my master. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather. Go the fore convey the region of my heart. Be kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. What wouldst thou do, old man? Think'st thou that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows? To plainness, honour's bound when majesty falls to folly. Reserve thy state and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness. Answer my life. My judgment, thy youngest daughter, does not love thee least, nor are those empty hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness. And on thy life, no more. My life. I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies. 
out of my sight. See better, Leah, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo! Now by Apollo, King, thou swearest thy desire! Revoke thy gift! Or once I can vent clamor from this throat, I will tell thee thou dost evil! Hear me, recreant. Hear me, on thine allegiance, hear me. Hi. Days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the next day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominion, that moment is thy death. Away, thy Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Fare thee well, king. Sith thus thou wilt appear. Freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shape shall to take thee, maid. That justly thinks, and has most rightly said. And your large speeches. May your deeds approve that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kento princes bids you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Hers, France, and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address toward you who with this king hath rivaled for our daughter. What in the least will you require in present dower with her, or cease your quest of love? Most royal majesty, I crave no more than hath your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Sir, when she was dear to us, we did hope her so. But now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands, she's there, and she is yours. I know no answer. Sir, will you? With those infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her or leave her. Pardon me, royal sir, but election makes not up in such conditions. Then leave her, sir. By the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore beseech you to turn your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is most strange that she, who even but now was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, the best, the dearest, should in this trice of time commit an act so monstrous as to dismantle so many folds of faith? I yet beseech your majesty, if for I want that glib and oily art to speak, and purpose not, since what I well intend I'll do it before I speak, that you make know and it is no vicious blot. Murder, foulness, no unchaste action, nor dishonoured step that hath deprived me of your grace and favour. But even for want of that, for which I am richer, and still soliciting I and such a tongue, that I am glad I have not, though not to have it, and lost me in your liking. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better. Is it no more but this? A tardiness in nature, which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do. My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? Will you have her? She is herself a dowry. Royal sir, give but that portion which yourself proposed, and here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing. I have sworn I am firm. I am sorry, then, you have so lost a father that you must lose a husband. Peace be with Burgundy, since that respect and fortunes are his love. I shall not be his wife. Fairest Cordelia, 
that art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken and most loved despised, thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be it lawful, I take up what is cast away. Oh, gods, gods, it is strange that from their codes neglect my love should kindle to inflame respect. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Not all the dukes of Waters Burgundy can buy this unprized, precious maid of me. <coughs> but then farewell, Cordelia, though unkind, thou losest here a better where to find. Thou hast her, France. Let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore, be gone without our grace, our love, our benison. Come, noble Burgundy. But farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father. With washed eyes, Cordelia leaves you. I know you what you are, and like a sister am most loath to call your faults as they are named. Love well our father. To your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duty. Let your study be to content your lord, who hath received you at fortune's arms. You have obedience scanted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides, who cover faults at last with shame derides. Well may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Sister! It is not a little, I have to say, of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain, and with you, next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. He always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time have been but rash. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this, of Kent's banishment. Pray you, let us hit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall further think of it. We must do something. And the heat. dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous and my shape as true, as honest, madam's issue. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base, <laughs> who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull Stale, tired bed, go to the creating a whole tribe of fops, got twin asleep and wake. Well then, legitimate Edgar, 
I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edward as to the legitimate. Fine word. Legitimate. <laughs> well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the Bates shall top the legitimate. I grow. I prosper. Now, God. Stand up for bastards. Kent banished us, and France in color parted, and the king, strong to the night, prescribed his power, confined to exhibition, and all is done upon the gad. Edmund! How now, what news? So please, your lordship, none. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper will you read it? Nothing, my lord. No, what needed in that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Let's see, come. If it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother, which I have not yet all read. And for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend, either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope for my brother's justification he hath writ this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny. Come to me that of this I may speak more if my father would sleep till I waked him. You should enjoy half his revenue and live the beloved of your brother Edgar. Oh. Conspiracy. Sleep till I wake him. You should enjoy half his revenue. My son Edgar, have your hand to write this. A heart and a brain to breed it in. When came this to you? Who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. That's the coming of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. And you know the character to be your brother's? It is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. And has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. Although, I, I have heard him maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers declined, that the father should be his ward to the son and the son manage his revenge. Villain! Villain! His very opinion in the letter! Abhorred villain! Unnatural, detested, brutish villain! Worse than brutish! Gosera sicum! I'll apprehend him! Abominable villain! Where is he? I do not well know, my lord. I dare pawn down my life for him, that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honour and to no other pretense of danger. He cannot be such a monster! No, is not sure. To his father, who so tenderly and entirely loves him, heaven and earth. Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I shall seek him presently. Frame the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses of the sun and moon portend no good to us. Love cools. Friendship falls off. Brothers divide. In cities, mutinies, and countries, treason. Palaces, discord. And the bond cracked twixt son and father. Find out this villain, Edmund. She'll lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble, true-hearted Kent banished his offense. Honesty. Tis strange. Strange. <laughs> this is the excellent foppery of the world. That when we are sick in fortunes, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and the stars. As if we were villains on necessity. Fools by heavenly compulsion. Knaves, thieves, treacherous, drunkards, liars, adulterers. A 
and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting of an admirable evasion of whore-master man to lay his goatish disposition on the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows that I and Rob and Lich. But I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkle on my bastardizing. But he comes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is a villainous melancholy with a sigh like Tom O'Bendler. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions for so of me. Oh, now, Brother Edmund, what serious contemplation are you in? <laughs> I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day, what should follow these eclipses. Oh, do you busy yourself with that? I promise you, the effects he writes of succeed unhappily, as of unnaturalness between the child and the parent, death, death, divisions of states, menaces and maledictions, banishments of friends, nuptials, breaches, and I know not what. How long have you been a secretary astronomical? <laughs> come, come. When saw you my father last? Why, the night gone by. Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms? Found you no displeasure in him by word nor countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself whereon you have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray you go, there's my key. If you do stir abroad, go arm. Arm, brother. Brother, I advise you to the best. I have told you what I have seen and heard, faintly. Nothing like the image and the horror of it. Pray you away. Shall I have from you anon? I do serve you in this business. Credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit, or with me's meat that I can fashion fit. Did my father strike my gentleman for tying up his fool? Oh, I know. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds, I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous, and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I'll not speak with him. Say I'm sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. He's coming, madam, I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he distastes it, let him to my sister, whose mind and mine I know in that are one not to be overruled. Idle old man that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Remember what I've said. Very well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter, advise your fellows so. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Go! Prepare for dinner! Now banished Kent, Thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned. So may it come thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labours. <laughs> Let thee not stay a jot for dinner. Go, get it ready. How oh, now? What art thou? A man, sir? What art thou? A 
very honest-hearted fellow and as poor as the king. <laughs> Thou beast, as poor for a subject as he's for a king. Thou art poor enough. <laughs> what wouldst thou? Service. Whom wouldst thou serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir. But you had that in your countenance, I would fain call master. What's that? Authority. Uh, what services canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, mar a curious tale and telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. Well, follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee yet. <laughs> dinner! Oh, yeah! Where's my name, my fool? Go you, fetch my fool hither. Oh, you, sirrah, where is my daughter? So please you. What, what set the fellow yonder? Go, call the clock pole back. And where's my fool? I think the world's asleep. Ah, oh, now, where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came not the slave back when I did call for him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. Would not? My lord, I don't know what the matter is, but... Well, to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. Mm -hmm. Sayst thou so, we will look further into it. But where's my fool? I've not seen him these two days. Well, since my young lady's going into France, sir, the fool has much pine away. Uh, no more of that. I have noted it. Go you, tell my daughter I would speak with her. Go you, call my fool hither. Oh, now, you, sir. Come hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. <laughs> my lady's father. My lord's name, you horse and dog, you slave, you cur. I am none of these, my lord. Do I you? Seat your pie. Bandy, look <laughs> with me, you <laughs> rascal. Not be struck in, my lord. Nor truck neither, you base football player. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my friendly name, I'll pay thee for thy service. Let me hire him too. Ah, here's my coxcomb. My delicate knave, how dost thou? Sir, are you best to take my coxcomb? Why, fool? Why? For taking one's part that's out of favour. Nay, and thou can't smile as the wind sits. Thou catch cold shortly. Here's my coxcomb. Oh, why, th this fellow has banished two Zon's daughters and done a third a blessing against his will. If thou follows him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. <laughs> oh, how now, Uncle? Would I had two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, boy? Why, if I'd given them all my livings, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. Here's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. <laughs> Take heed, Sarah. Thou whip. Oh, truth the dog, Master Kennedy must be whipped out when Lady Bitch may stand by the fire and stink. No, <laughs> pestilent gall to me. Sirrah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do, boy. Mark it, Nuncle. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, ride more than thou goest, lend less than thou owest, set less than thou trowest, learn more than thou knowest, leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. <laughs> this is nothing, fool! Why then, it is like the breast of an unfeed lawyer, for you gave me nothing for it. Can thou make no use of nothing, Nuncle? Why, no, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. But if he tell him, so much the rent of his land comes to, he will not believe a fool. A bitter fool? Oh, dost thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, lad, teach me. That lord that counsel thee to give away thy land, set him here by me. Do thou for him stand? A sweet and bitter fool will presently appear, a one in motley here. The other found out there. <laughs> thou call me fool, boy. All thy other titles thou hast given away. That thou wast born with. Well, this is not altogether fool, my lord. Nay, faith, lords and great men will not let me keep the fool to myself. They'll be snatching. <laughs> Nuncle, give me an egg, and I'll give thee two crowns. What? Two crowns? Shall they be? Why? After I've cut the egg in the middle, and et up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. Thou hast little wit in thy bold crown when thy gavest thy golden one away. 
Fools had no less grace in a year when wise men are grown foppish. They know not how their wits to wear. <laughs> their manners are so apish. <laughs> when wast thou used to be so full of songs, boy? I have used it, Nuncle, ere since thy maids, thy daughters, thy mothers. Ere since you gaste them the rod and puts down thine own breeches. For thee, Nuncle. Keep a schoolmaster that could teach a fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. Can you lie, sinner? We'll have you whipped. I marvel at what thou and thy kin are. They'll, they'll have me whipped for speaking true, they'll have me whipped for lying, and sometimes I'm whipped for holding my peace. <laughs> I'd rather be any kind of thing than a fool, uncle. Yet I would not be thee. Thou hast paired thy wit on both sides and left nothing in the middle. Oh, and here comes one of the pairings. How oh, no, daughter! What, what makes this frontlet on? Me, me, methinks you are too much elated of brown. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for frowning. Now thou art like an O without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. Oh, yes, yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue so your face bids me. Though you say nothing, mum, mum. Not only, sir, this. You're all licensed fool. The other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank, and not to be endured riots. Are you our daughter? I would you would make use of your good wisdom, whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions which of late transport you from what you rightly are. <laughs> Just any here. No, me. <laughs> this is not Leah. <clears throat> Does Leah walk thus? Speak thus? Where are his eyes? Who is it that can tell me who I am? Leah's shadow. Your name, fair gentlewoman. This admiration, sir, is much of the savour of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright. As you are old and reverend, should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this, our oh, court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust makes it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself does speak for instant remedy. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs. A little to disquantity your train, and the remainder that shall still depend, to be such men as may besought your age, which know themselves and you. Darkness and devils! Saddle my horses! Call my train together! Degenerate bastard, I'll not trouble you. Yet have I left a daughter. You strike my people and your disordered rabble. Make servants of their betters. Uh, oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir. Prepare my horses. Pray, sir, be patient. Thou likest my train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. Most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordelia show. Oh, Leah, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. My lord, I am guiltless as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Hear nature, hear dear goddess, hear. Suspend thy purpose. If thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful, into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase. 
from her derogate body never spring a babe to honour her. If she must teem, create her child of spleen, that it may live to be a thwart, disnatured torment to her, turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt, that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. What's the matter, sir? Thy pan. Death, I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus. <laughs> These farm tears that break from me perforce should make thee worth them. Blasts and fogs upon thee, the untented woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Oh, fond eyes, for weep this cause again, and I'll pluck you out, cast you on the waters that you loose to temper clay. Yea, is it come to this? Let it be so. I have another daughter who I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear this of thee, with her nail she'll flay thy wolvish visage. Thou shalt find I'll resume that shape which thou dost think I have cast off for ever. Do you mark that? I cannot be so partial, Goneril, to the great love I bear. Are you content? What else will do? And you, sir, more knave than fall after your master. Oh, no, good Leah, no, good Leah, tarry and take thy fall with me. This man hath good counsel. A hundred knights! Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred knights. Yes! That on each dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint dislike, he may and guard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say! Well, you may fear too far. Safer than trust too far. What he hath uttered, I have written my sister. She sustained him and his knights when I've shown thy unfitness. How now? What? Have you written that letter to my sister? Aye, madam. Take you some company and await to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and thereto add such reason of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone, and hasten your return. No, no, my lord, this milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn it not, yet under pardon, you are much more a task for want of wisdom than praised for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to better, oft we mar what's well. Nay, then. Well. Well, the event. Go you before me with this letter. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there before you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I have delivered your letter. Shalt see thy other daughter will treat thee kindly. For though she says like this is a crab's like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. What canst tell, boy? She will taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Canst thou tell why one's nose stands in the middle on's face? No. Why? To keep one's eyes on either side's nose. So what a man cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell how an oyster makes its shell? No, nor I neither. <laughs> but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why to put head in. Not to give us away to thy daughters and leave thy horns without a case. I will forget my nature, so kind of father. The reason the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they are not a... Yes, indeed! Thou would make a good fool. <laughs> if thou were my fool, Nunsville, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. 
How's that? Thou shouldst not have been old, till thou hadst been wise. Let me not be mad. Not mad, sweet heavens. Keep me in temper. I would not be mad. How now? Be my horses ready? Ready, my lord. Come, boy. Brother, a word to send in, brother, and say. My father watches. Oh, sir, fly at this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall, Lord? He's coming hither in the night, in the haste, and Regan with him. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I I'm sure on it's not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw. Seem to defend yourself. Now quit you well. Yells come before my father. Light. Oh, here. Fly, brother. Fly. Torches. Torches. So farewell. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavour. <laughs> Seen drunkards do more than this in sport. Ah, father! Father, stop! Stop! What, no help? No, Edmund! Where is the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms and conjuring the moon to stand his auspicious mistress. Where is he? Oh, sir, I plead. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir. When by no means he Pursue him all! Go after! By no means... What? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But that I told him the revenging gods against parasites did all their thunders bend. Spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father. Let him fly far. For in this land shall he remain uncaught. Found. Dispatch. He that finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous card to the stake. He that conceals him, death. Oh, strange and fast villain. I never got him. Oh, the Duke's trumpets, I know not why he comes. All thoughts I'll bar. The villain shall not escape. His picture I will send far and near that all the kingdom shall have due note of him and of my land. Loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short which can pursue the fender. How doth my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked, it's cracked. What? Did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named your Edgar? Oh, lady, lady, shame would have it hid. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tended upon my father? No, no, madam. Tis too bad. Yes. Too bad. Yes, madam. He was of that consort. No marvel then, though he were ineffected. Tis they have put him on the old man's death to have the expense and waste of his revenues. <coughs> I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them and with such cautions. And if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, have you shown your father a childlike office? was my duty, sir. He did beray his practice and received this hurt, you see, striving to apprehend him. Is he pursued? I, my good lord. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. For you, Edmund, natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. No, not why we came to visit you. Thus out of season, threading dark-eyed night. Occasions, noble Gloucester, of some poise wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father, he hath writ, so hath our sister, of differences which I best thought it fit to answer from our home. Our good old friend, lay comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves the instant use. I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Good morning to thee, friend. Out of this house? Aye. Right. Well, where may we set our horses? 
in the mire? Prithee, if thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base proud, shallow beggarly, free suited, hundred pound filthy worsted stocking knave, <laughs> a lily living action taking knave. A horse and glass gazing, super serviceable, finical rogue. One trunk inheriting slave. One that would be a bored in way of good service. And not nothing but the composition of a knave beggar, coward panda, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch. One <laughs> whom I would beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. What a monstrous fellow art thou! That's the rail upon one that is neither known to thee nor knows thee. What a brazen face, violet art thou, to deny thou knowest me? Is it two days since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? <sighs> Draw, you rogue, for though it be night, yet the moon shines. I'll make a sopper the moon shine you. Draw, your horse and cullionly barber monger. Draw! Away! I have nothing to do with thee. <laughs> Draw, you rascal. You come with letters against the king, and take vanity the puppet's part against the royalty of her father. Draw you, rogue, or I'll soak your banana your face! Draw you, rascal! Come your ways! Draw, thief! Stand slave! Stay too neat slave! Draw you to the butt! Oh. With you, good man boy, if you please, come, I'll flesh you! Come on, young master! What's the matter? Here! Fish upon your lives! He dies and strikes again! What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king! What is your difference? Speak! I'm scarce in breath, my lord. Oh, no marvel you would so be stirred your valour, you cowardly rascal. Ah, speak yet, I'll call this quarrel. <laughs> this ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared, at suit of his grey beard, hath... <laughs> thou horse and said, thou unnecessary letter! Spare my grey beard, you! Nay, <laughs> sir! <laughs> Beastly knave, no in all reverence. Yes, sir! But anger have a privilege. Why thou angry? There's such a slave as this should wear a sword who wears no honesty. What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. <laughs> no more perchance does mine, nor his nor hers. Sir, it is my occupation to be plain. I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder I see before me at this instant. This is some fellow. Having been praised for bluntness, does affect a saucy roughness, and constrains the garb quite from his nature. What was the offence you gave him? I never gave him any. It pleased the king his master very late to strike at me upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drawn me here again. Fetch forth the stocks! Stubborn ancient knave, you reverend braggart, will teach you. Sir, I am too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me. I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. Let's forth the stocks, as I have life and honour. There shall he sit till noon. Till noon? Till night, my lord. And all night, too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same colour our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. The king, his master, needs must take it ill that he so slightly valued in his messenger should have a master restraint. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Well, put in his legs. Come, my good lord. Away. I'm sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray do not, sir. I have watched and trembled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out the wrist or whistle. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. Twill be ill taken. All weary and all watched. Take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. Turn thy wheel. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. 
No port is free. No place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. While I may escape, I will preserve myself. And I'm bethought to take the basest and most poor a shape that ever penury and contempt of man brought ne'er to beast. My face, I'll grime with filth. Blanket, my loins, elf, all my hair in knots and with presented nakedness. I'll face the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedence of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms. Pins, wooden spikes and nails, a sprigs of rosemary and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, a sheep cots, mills sometimes with lunatic vans, sometimes with prayers, enforce their charity. Something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. It is strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned the night before, there was no purpose in them of this removal. Hail to thee, noble master. Uh, make thou this shame thy pastime? No, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> he wears cruel garters. Uh, what's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yea. No, they would not. Yes, they have. Why? <laughs> Jupiter, I swear, no! But you know, I swear I! They durst not do it! They would not, could not do it! Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage! Winter's not gone yet if the wild geese fly that way! Where is this daughter? With the old sir here with it. Uh, follow me not! Stay here! Our chance the king comes with so small a number! Thou hadst been set in the stocks for that question, and thou hadst well deserved it. <laughs> Why, fool? I'll set thee to school an ant, to teach thee that there's no labouring in the winter. Let go thy hold when a great wheel rolls downward, lest it break thy neck in following. But the great one that travels upward, let it draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I'd have none but knaves use it since a fool gives it. Where learned you this fool? Oh, not in the stocks, fool. <laughs> Deny to speak with me. <laughs> they are sick. They are weary. They have travelled all the night. Fetch me a better answer. My dear lord, you know the fiery quality of the duke. How unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Fiery? What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed uh, them, informed sir. Informed them. Dost thou understand me, man? Aye, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak. Commands! Tends service. Are they informed of this, my breath and blood? But where is this daughter? Go, fetch my daughter for death on my stake. Wherefore should he sit there? Give me my servant for Go tell the Duke and his wife I'd speak with them. Now, presently, bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Me, my heart, my rising heart. Don't cry to it, Nuzco, as the cock needed to the eels when she put them in the paste alive. She napped them on the coxcombs and cried, Down, Wontons, down! 
'twas her brother that out of pure kindness to his horse butted his hay. Good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. I'm glad to see your highness. Oh, Regan, I think you are. Ah, are you free? Some other time for that. I love it, Regan. Thy sister's naught. She had said sharp to done kindness like a vulture here. Yeah. I can't scarce speak to thee. Not believe with how depraved a quality, oh Regan. I pray you, sir, take patience. I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If, sir, perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers, it is on such grounds and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curses on her! Sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you that to our sister you do make return. Say you have wronged her. Ask her forgiveness! Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. <laughs> Age is unnecessary. <laughs> On my knees I beg that you vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train. Looked black upon me. Struck me with her tongue most serpent-like upon the very heart. All the stored vengeances of Heaven liked on her ungrateful tie, sir, fire! Oh, the blessed gods! So will you wish on me when the rash mood is on. No, Regan, thou shalt never feel my curse. Thy tender-hearted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Thou better knowst the offices of nature, bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, Dues of gratitude, thy half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot wherein I thee end up. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? What trumpet's that? I know it, my sisters. This approves our letter that she would soon be here. Is your lady come? Who stocked my servant, Regan? I have good hope thou didst not know, aunt. But who comes here? Oh, heavens, I'm not ashamed to look upon this Theodore Regan. Will you take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds a dotage term so. How came my man in the stock? I set him there, sir, but his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You? Did you? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so. If, till the expiration of your month, you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. Return with her, and fifty men dismissed. Uh, rather, I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf and owl. Necessity's sharp pinch. Return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. I prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. Yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. I can be patient. 
I can stay with Regan. I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. What? Fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Yea, or so many sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number. How in one house can many people under two commands hold amity? It is hard, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those she called servants or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositories. But kept a reservation to be followed of such a number. What? Must I come to you with five and twenty? Regan said you so. Speak it again, my lord. No more with me. <laughs> I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty? Ten or five to follow in a house where twice so many have command to tend you? What need one? Reason of the need? Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. But a true need. You heavens give me that patience. Patience I need. You see me here, you gods. A poor old man as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stir these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely, and let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags! I will have such revenges on you both, that all the world shall, I will do such things, what they are yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping. This heart of mine shall break into a hundred thousand cracks, or ere I weep. So oh, fool, I shall go mad. Let us withdraw. Tell me a stall. This house is little. The old man, as people, cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame. Has put himself from rest and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So am I purpose. Where is my lord of Gloucester? Follow the old man for. He is returned. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse, but will I know not whither? It is best to give him way. He leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on. The high winds to sorely ruffle. For many miles about the scarce of food. Oh, sir. To willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors! Shut up your doors, my lord! My Regan counsels well! Come after the storm! And hurricane, oh, spout! 
till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks, you sulfurous and thought-executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head! Thunder! Strike flat the thick rotundity of the world! Crack nature's moulds! All Germans spill at once that make ingrateful man! Oh, knuckle! Good knuckle in and ask thy daughter's blessing! Here's a night the pity's neither wise men nor fools! Bellyful, spit fire, spout rain, nor rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax you, not you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand. Stand your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. For yet I call you servile ministers that will, with two pernicious daughters, join your high engendered battles against a head so old and white as this. <laughs> has a house to put his head in, has a good headpiece. Oh, I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. Mary, his grace should have caught peace that's a wise man and a fool. Oh, alas, so are you here. The things that love night love not such nights as these. Since I was man, such sheets of fire, such bursts of horrid thunder, such groans of roaring wind and rain I never remember to have heard. Man's nature cannot carry the friction nor the fear. Uh, 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 let the great gods that keep this dreadful pudder o'er our heads find out their enemies now. I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Gracious my lord, hard by here is a hobble. Some friendship will lend you against the tempest. Repose you there. My, my, my wits begin to turn. Come on, my boy. How does my boy? I'm cold. I'm cold myself. Where is this straw, my fellow? <laughs> the art of our necessities is strange and can make vile things. Precious, come, your hovel. Oh, fool and knave, I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. He that it has a little tiny wit with a head full, the wind and the rain has taken it with fortune's sin, though the rain is rain. Alack, Edmund, I like not this unnatural dealing. When I desired their leave that I might pity him, they took from me the use of mine own house. Judge me on pain of perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him, entreat for him, or in any way sustain him. Oh, savage and unnatural. Don't you say you nothing? There is division between the dukes. And a worse matter than that, I have received a letter this night. It's dangerous to be spoken. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged. Oh, there is part of a power already put it. We must incline to the king. I will seek him. Go you will maintain talk with the duke that my charity be not of him perceived. If he asks for me, I am ill and gone to bed. If I die for it, there's no less is threatened me. The king, my old master, must be relieved. 
there are strange things to warn Edmund. I pray you, be careful. This courtesy forbid me shall the Duke instantly know, and of that letter too. This seems a fair deserving, and must draw me that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. <laughs> Here is the place, my lord! Good my lord, enter! The tyranny of the younger knights through rough and nature to his Let me alone! The good my lord, enter here! What's to break my hand? Why, I'd rather break my own. Good my lord, enter! Thou oh, thinks tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin. <laughs> so is to thee. And where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser scarce is felt. Forons, I will endure of such a night. O oh, Regan, Goneril, my old kind father, whose frank heart gave thee all. Oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that no more of that. Good my lord, enter here. Go in thyself, seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. I'll go in. In, boy. Go first. You houseless poverty. Nay, nay, get thee in. I'll pray, and then I'll sleep. Oh, naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are that by the pelting of this piteous storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I have taken too little care of this. Scramble there in the straw! Come forth! Away! The mouthy follows me! Oh, who the sharp, awful loads of gold wind! Go to thy cold bed and warm thee! Didst, didst thou give all to thy daughters and art come to this? <laughs> who gives anything to poor Tom? Who the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame, through fall and whirlpool of a fucking quagmire? Oh, Tom's of gold! Lest thy five wits, lest thee from whirlwind, star blastings, and takings, do poor Tom some charity! Who the foul fiend vexes? Have his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing? Didst thou give them all? Nay, he reserved a blanket, else we'd all be shamed. Now all the plagues that in the pendulous air hang fainty poor men's faults light on thy daughters. He hath no daughters, sir! <laughs> yes, traitor! Nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowness but his unkind daughters. Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have such little mercy on their flesh? Judicious punishment. Twas this flesh forgot those pelican daughters. Billy Gog said on Billy Gog Hill, the Lord. Oh, this cold night will turn us all into fools and madmen! Take heed on a foul fiend! Obey thy parents and keep thy word justly! Swear not! Come in not with mad sworn spouse! Set not thy sweet heart in proud array! Oh, times are cold! <laughs> Why, thou wert better in thy grave! And to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the skies. 
is man. No more than this. Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk, the sheep no hide, the beast no wool, the cat no perfume. Yes, Rians are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more than such a fair hawked animal as thou art. Off, off, you lending! Come and battle here! Prithee now come to the naughty night to swim in! <laughs> what? Oh! A walking fire! Uh, that is a foul fame! Flippity gibbet! He starts our curfew and walks to the first cot. Who's that? What is your sake? What are you there? The name! Poor Tom! That eats the walking frog. The toad! The tadpole! The wall newt and the water! Please! Smoke it! Please! The fiend! What? At your grace no better company! The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman! Modo, he's called a mahu. Our flesh and blood, my lord, has grown so vile that they hate what gets it. Poor Tom's a god. Go in with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands. Though their injunction be to bar my doors and let this tyrannous night take hold upon you, yet have I ventured to come seek you out and bring you where both fire and food is ready. First, let me speak a word with this philosopher. <laughs> what, what is the cause of thunder. Good my lord, take his offer, go into the house. I'll speak a word with this same learned Theban. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and kill vermin. Oh, I, let me have one word with you in private. Importune him once more to go in, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Canst thou blame him? His daughters seek his death. Ah, oh, that good Kent. He said it would be thus. Poor banished man. Thou sayest the king grows mad. I tell thee, friend, I am almost mad myself. I had a son, now outlawed from my blood. He sought my life. But lately, very late, I loved him, friend. No father, his son dearer. True to tell thee that grief hath crazed my wits. What a night is this. I do beseech your grace. Oh, I cry you mercy. Noble philosopher, your company. Oh, Tom Zuckol. In fellow there, into the hovel, take the wall, let's all in. Oh, this way, my lord. With him, I will keep still with my philosopher. Good, my lord, so then let him take the fellow, take you him on. Sinner, come on, go along with us. Come, good Athenian. No words, no words. Hush. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Try a rolling. To the dark tower came. His word was still by foe and bump. I smell the blood of a British man. <laughs> I shall have my revenge ere I depart his house. Here is the letter he spoke of, which proves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. Oh, that this treason were not, or not I, the detector. Go with me to the Duchess. If the matter of this paper is certain, you have mighty business in hand. Sure, false, have made thee Earl of Gloucester. Seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. I will persever in this course of loyalty, though the matter be sore between that and my blood. I shall lay trust upon thee, and thou shalt find a dear father in my love. Here is better than the open air. Take it thankfully. I will piece out the comfort with what addition I can. I will not be long from you. The gods reward your kindness. Fritoretto calls me and tells me Nero's an angler in the lake of darkness. Pray, innocent, beware the foul thing. Privy, no come. Tell me whether a madman be a gentleman or a yeoman. A king, a king. No, 
is a yeoman that has a gentleman to his son. Or he's a mad yeoman that sees his son a gentleman before him. You have a thousand with red burning spits come hissing in upon them. Ah! The foul fiend bites my back! It shall be done! I will arraign them straight. Come, sit thou there, most learned justice, huh? Thou, sapient sir, sit there. No, no, you she foxes! Oh, look where she stands and glares! How do you, sirs? Stand you not so amazed? Will you lie down upon the cushions? I'll see their trial first. Bring in their evidence! Thou, robed man of justice, take thy place. And thou, his yoke fellow of equity, bench by his side. You, sir, you are of a commission, sit you too. <laughs> Let us deal justly. Arraign her first. Tis Goneril! I here take my oath before this honourable assembly. Take the poor king her father! Come hither, mistress. Is your name Goneril? Uh, she cannot deny it. Oh, cry your mercy. I took you for a joint stool. And here's another who, <laughs> whose warped looks proclaim what store her heart is made on. Stop her! Oh, stop her there! Arms, arms! Sword, fire! Corruption in the place! False justice, sir! Why didst thou let her escape? Oh, bless thy five wits! Oh, pity, sir! Where is the patience now that you so often posted to retain? My tears begin to take his part so much they mar my counterfeiting. <laughs> the, the little dogs and all, Trey, Blanche, and sweetheart, see how they bark at me! Tom will throw his head at him! Avon! You curse! D d d d <laughs> I? Then, let them anatomize Regan. <laughs> see what breeds about her heart! Is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? You, sir, I entertain for one of my hundred. Only, I do not like the fashion of your garments. <laughs> you, you will say they are Persian, but let them be changed. Now, good my lord, lie here and rest a while. Make no noise. Make, make no noise. Draw the curtains. So. 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 Uh, we'll go to supper in the morning. And I'll go to bed at noon. Come hither, friend! How oh, is the king, my master? I sleep, sir. Trouble him not. His wits are gone. I prithee, friend. Take him in thy arms. I have all heard a plot of death upon him. There is a litter ready. Lay him in it and drive toward Dover, friend, where thou shalt find both welcome and protection. Take up thy master, if thou shouldst tell thee half an hour, his life with thine and all that offer to defend him stand an assured loss. Take up, take up, and follow me. That will to some provision give thee quick conduct. Come, come, away. Oh, speedily to my lord, your husband, given this letter. The army of France is landed. Seek out the traitor Gloucester. Hang him instantly. Black out his eyes. Leave him to my displeasure. Edmund, keep your sister company. The revenges we are bound to perform upon your traitorous father are not for your beholding. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my lord of Gloucester. Farewell, sweet lord and sister. Edmund, farewell. Seek out the traitor Gloucester. Pinion him like a thief. Bring him before us. Up me, sirs! Who's there, uh, the traitor? Ingrateful fox, titty! What means your presence? Good, my friends! Consider! You are my guests! Oh, do 
be no foul play, hold friends. Him, hold him, I say. Hard. Hard. Oh, filthy traitor. And merciful ladies, you are a nun. Ah, oh, by the kind gods. Tis most ignobly done to pluck me by the beard. So white and such a traitor. Naughty lady, these hairs which thou dost ravish from my chin will quicken and accuse thee. I am your host. With robber's hands, my hospitable favours, you should not ruffle thus. What will you do? Come, sir. What letters have you late from France? Be simple answered, for we know the truth. And what confederacy have you with the traitors late footed in the kingdom? To whose hands have you sent the lunatic king? Speak. I have a letter guessingly set down, which came from one that's of a neutral heart and not from one opposed. Dunning! And false. Where has I sent the king? To Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Wast thou not charged Wherefore with Wherefore to Dover? Let him first answer that. I am tied to the stake and I must stand the court. Wherefore to Dover? Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh stick boorish fangs. But I shall see the winged vengeance or take such... Children! See it, shalt thou never! Fellows, hold the chair! Upon these eyes of thine, I'll set my foot! He that will think to live, kill the old! Give me some help! Ah! Crawl! Ah! You go! One side will mock another, the other two! If you see vengeance! Hold your hand, my lord! I have served you ever since you were a child, and better service have I never done than now to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If we'd wear a beard upon your chin, I'd shake it on this quarrel. Aye, villain. Aye. Come on. We take the chance of anger. Ah! Mischief on them! That should seem more prevented! Out! My old chili! Where is thy luster now? Oh, dark and comfortless! Where is my son, Edmund? Edmund! And kindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act! Out, treacherous villain! Thou callst on him that hates thee! It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my folly. <laughs> then Edgar was abused. No! Oh, thrust him out again to let him smell his way to Dover. How's my lord? How oh, look you? I received the hurt, lady. <laughs> Turn out this eyeless villain. Throw this slave upon the downhill. Help me to pace. Untimely comes this wound! <laughs> 